Isn't it important what people think of you? Doesn't money have to be the priority? Isn't there lots to worry about? Jesus said, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Good morning. It's great to be with each and every one of you here this morning. We're going to continue on in our series entitled The Sermon on the Mount and Staying Focused. But this morning we're going to be dealing with a subject that's a little bit sticky for some people, dealing with the issue of finances, money. This has always been something that's always captured my interest for when I was younger, say 14, 15, and 16, if you were to ask me, what do I want to be when I grow up? My response was, a stockbroker. A stockbroker. And as you can see, uh, I'm not a stockbroker. God has uh, led me in a different direction and called me into the ministry, but certainly my interest when it comes to what the markets are doing and uh, how finances work has always captured my attention. So when it comes to Scripture, it is certainly interesting when Jesus is speaking about the importance of stewardship and the importance of understanding money. So if you have your Bibles with you or you're looking at Scripture on another medium, open them up to uh, Matthew chapter 6, where we left off last week, starting in verse 19. It reads, Do not store up your treasures here on earth where they can be eaten by moths or get rusty and where thieves can break in and steal. Store up your treasures where there will never be moth-eaten or rusty or where there will be safe from thieves. Whether your treasure is or wherever your treasure is, your heart and thoughts will also be. Your eye is a lamp for your body. A pure eye lets sunshine into your soul, but an evil eye shuts out the light and plunges you into darkness. If the light you think you have is really darkness, how deep the darkness will be. No one can serve two masters, for you will either hate one or love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So when it comes to scriptures like this, a number of misconceptions can come through. The first one that I believe that oftentimes people feel like the church is suggesting is that money is the root of all evil. Therefore, anybody in the financial industry or anybody who's you know, a banker or stockbroker, they're evil. So we should probably not have as much or as little to do with these people as possible. And on the flip side over here is, you know, we can really attribute the scripture where it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For these people are truly blessed because they're selfless and they're humble and they're, you know, they're able to just focus on Jesus because they don't have anything. Is this really what Jesus is saying here? Is this really what Scripture recommends or suggests? The other major misconception when it comes to Scriptures like this, and I would believe that this is the most major issue that we struggle with as a church, is when it comes to finances within Scriptures, we often want to hit the skip button. We want to skip over it. Because we often think that, oh, well, it doesn't really apply to me. Like the rich young ruler, I'm not rich, so it doesn't really apply to me. Well, let me tell you, the crowd in which Jesus is presenting these scriptures to is the ultra-rich, the middle class, the poor, and the absolute destitute. These scriptures have application to every single monetary demographic. 
And so my prayer for you this morning is that you would not hit, hit the skip button, but that you would truly ask yourself, God, how are you speaking to me? Jesus Christ, O oh Holy Spirit, how do you want to use me in terms of my finances, in terms of my gifting, in terms of my ability? Lord Jesus, as we further dive into your scriptures this morning. We just ask that you would open up our hearts and open up our minds as we ask these difficult questions in terms of how you're asking us to honor you with our finances, with our time, with our gifting, however, God, you've wired us and blessed us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let's go back again. Let's go back to verse 19. The first three verses reads again as follows. Do not store your treasures up here on earth where they can be moth-eaten or get rusty and where thieves can break in and steal. Store your treasures up in heaven where they will never be moth-eaten or get rusty or where they will be safe from thieves. Wherever your treasure is, your heart and thoughts will also be. This treasure that the scriptures are speaking about here, what is it? Oftentimes, we might think it's, oh, it's our tithe. But in fact, I believe Jesus is speaking about a much broader picture than just our tithe. I believe it would be inclusive of the tithe, but it's a whole picture. It's not just your finances. It's your financial picture. It's your giftedness. It's where you spend your time. It's your entire orientation. Oftentimes, we get caught up with our orientation being in one direction, but we say, oh yeah, our heart's in a different direction. Just imagine a sailboat. If we were to go out sailing this morning and... Uh, pretend the, the water is a little bit warmer, and we were to get out in the water, and we would rig up our main sheet and our jib sheet, we'd plot a course and kind of set a course across the bay or across Georgian Bay or whatever lake or body of water we're on. And as we set that course, we would expect that the sailboat, as long as our rudder man knows what they're doing, would go in that direction. But oftentimes, we are heading in a direction and we declare that our heart is with God. We say, oh yes, God, we love you. We sing these praise songs. We love you, Lord. But our total direction, our orientation with everything else in our life is going in a different direction. And essentially what Jesus is asking you here this morning is where is your direction? Where is your heart's orientation? For where you're oriented to, your heart will follow. The next two verses, verses 22 and 23, speak to these ends. They actually don't have anything to do with finances at all. And have everything to do with your orientation. Your eye is the lamp for your body. A pure eye lets sunshine into your soul. But an evil eye shuts out the light and plunges you into darkness. If the light you think you have is really darkness, oh, how deep the darkness will be. Your vision is your ability to see clearly. To focus. And Jesus is asking us to have a vision for him. A vision on the direction, on the kingdom values on which he's calling us. But so often we get distracted with various things in our life. And often our vision for Christ, the vision for the kingdom, often becomes blurred. And sometimes we think we see clearly, but often we're living in a perpetual state of darkness. The easiest way I can describe this is going and buying a car. The person who's selling you the car, if they're good at their job, will not only tell you about the features of the vehicle, 
They're going to pull on your emotional psyche. They're going to build that up so that you become emotionally attached to the vehicle. And the trick is, though, that they're making you believe that you're purchasing the vehicle based on facts rather than emotion. And now fast forward this scenario a little bit further. Now you have this hunk of metal and plastic sitting in your driveway and you're starting to pay for this vehicle. And although the number in which you're paying out every month is the exact same number you agreed to in the dealership, that number for some reason doesn't feel the same way. It's disappointing. And ultimately, what do cars do? They rust. Their value just plummets. But Jesus Christ is saying the value placed on me will never get rusty. He's saying if you keep your focus, you keep your vision on me, you'll never be disappointed. For all these other things, all these distractions, although they look good and all they feel good, they don't, won't actually bring the fulfillment in which you're looking for. And probably one of the greatest distractions that plagues our society is that of finances. Let's continue reading in verse 24, for it speaks to this end. No one can serve two masters, for you will either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't. Now, this is where I think a lot of us hit the skip button. Oh, I don't serve money. I'm not rich. And I mean, I can understand this sentiment because honestly, debt is all around us. Did you know the average Canadian household debt has well surpassed the $100,000 mark? This is according to a study that was released last year called the, from the Veneer Institute. Our national debt, which is much smaller than our neighbors to the south, is $580 billion. $580 billion. So with all this debt around us, it's no wonder that we don't have this sense that, oh, we're rich. Well, let me tell you, if we end up being bad managers of our money, and in turn being poor stewards, and we end up being almost choking on our own debt, where will our focus be? Who do we end up serving? We end up serving the debt. We end up having our focus oriented around the money. God is calling us to be men and women who honor Scripture. And if we do this, we're being called to a place of being good stewards good stewards of our finances. I think that one of the key things that we need to start to recognize is that the sooner we recognize our innate value, our net worth in the eyes of God, the sooner we won't feel like we need to fill our lives up with stuff. For we are amazingly and wonderfully created in the image of God. According to God, we are so beautiful. We are so wonderful. But yet, we feel like we are not adequate, so we have to fill our lives up with stuff. I love the way J.H. Jowett puts it. The measure of our true net worth is discovered in our value once we've lost all of our money. Think about it. Think about losing all of our money how much would you be worth? This is the value that God sees. So on the flip side, if we have been blessed with finances, I'm not saying that you have to think of yourself as rich, but if you view yourself in a stable position, 
How does this scripture speak to us? Well, I simply remind you of Luke 12, 48. For much is given, much is required. From, to whom much more is given, much more is required. We have been given an incredible responsibility. And if we're not careful, money can literally eat us alive. I was talking to Bonnie Payne, who is my sister-in-law, and she was just talking about her time when working for Magna at their golf course as a server. And not everybody, but a large portion of the people that would eat there had a sense of emptiness. You know, Bonnie would always say, you know, they just never looked happy. And yet, they're sitting around these gourmet meals and, you know, typically for a couple of people eating out, usually the bill would be three, four, five hundred dollars. Like, I mean, this is not cheap food. And yet, this money wasn't providing happiness. My brother-in-law, Chris Borche, he works in the motorized blind industry. And he works with fairly high-end families in Toronto. They, they would be kind of considered the, the super elite and these families, he would say that most of them in which he works with, like well over 90% of them, are broken families. Are broken. Money has not been a blessing to them. Money has not provided happiness. If we're not careful, money, if it becomes our focus, can literally suck the living light, life out of us. And what I read in verse 24 here is it's calling and asking us, each and every one of us, where is our loyalty? For it talks about who is our master. Is it God or money? It's important to us when people entrust us with their loyalty. Our spouses in a healthy relationship are, is loyal to us. Our children, most of the time, are loyal to us. And so this loyalty is important to us. And let me ask you this. Should it not be equally important to where you are placing your loyalty? For God is asking us to place our loyalty into Him. To be the master and commander of our life. A gentleman named Godfrey Davis did a historical biography on a fellow named the Duke of Wellington. And looking after all of his research in terms of putting together this biography, he wrote in the book that the most telling document was the ledger. Where did he put his finances? This was more insightful than any speech given, any letter written, for where the Duke of Wellington put his finances, communicated a whole lot about where his heart was. And let me tell you, the way you handle your finances tells a lot about your loyalty and about your heartfelt commitment to Jesus Christ. There's a scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. And it actually presents the answer to us. And when we ask the question, then how do we define what a rich man or woman is? What is a rich man or woman? Verse 6. It says, true religion with contentment is great wealth. Understanding who we are in Jesus Christ. Understanding who we are being called to be, and being content with this, this is great wealth. For verse 7 continues, it says, After all, we did not bring anything with us when we came into the world, and we certainly cannot carry anything with us when we die. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. 
but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plague them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Did you catch that? It's not the root of all evil. It's the root of all kinds of evil. Meaning we need to be careful here. And some people craving money have wandered afar from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Once again, this is affirming what Jesus was saying in the Sermon on the Mount. For Jesus was preaching and presenting these ideas to a very mixed crowd. This has nothing to do with whether you're super elite in terms of your financial picture or whether you are struggling to make ends meet. What is your focus? What is your orientation? Verse 17. Tell those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone. But their trust should be in the absolute amazing living God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Hallelujah. Tell them to use their money for good. They should be rich in good works and should give generously to those in need. This is our calling. Always being ready to share with others what God has given them. By doing this, we are storing up our treasures on a good foundation for the future. And this is the take-home message so that we may take hold of real life. Take hold of real life. For money will not buy a bed, sorry, money will buy a bed, but not sleep. Books, but not brains. Food, but not appetite. Veneer, but not beauty. A house, but not a home. Medicine, but not health. Luxuries, but not culture. Amusements, but not happiness. Religion, but not salvation. A passport to everywhere, but certainly not to heaven. As men and women of God, we are being called to be good stewards. To be good stewards with our resources, our times, and our finances. For our orientation is being called to focus and have a vision on kingdom values. And in turn, the scripture promises us that we will never be disappointed. That we will be inviting the sunshine to shine into our, the depths of our souls and grab hold of real life. This is my prayer for you. Lord Jesus, this is so much easier said than done. And Lord, as we get so distracted by so many things all around us, Lord, we just ask right now, that you would give us a vision for the kingdom, a vision for how you're directing us and leading us in our lives. And so, Lord, we invite our hearts to follow after that vision and to chase after that vision. And may we honor you with our finances and all of our other giftings as well in these purposes. We ask all of this in your precious namesake, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. God bless you.